So yesterday we learned the basics of our axiomatic system, like how to write well-formed formulas, what is allowed in our axiomatic system and what is not, and we talked about the meaning of the things we wrote, like when is a sentence true and when, it, when is it not. And afterwards I told you that there was this little section in the lecture notes about classes, uh, which we are not going to do. It is possible to do the whole class without talking about these, but then I decided I should include these, okay? So two days ago I lied, I'm gonna cover classes, then we're gonna start introducing the axioms. So what's a class? Why are we introducing these? You see, yesterday, sorry, two days ago I told you that everything in the universe of sets is a set. So every mathematical object is a set. But sometimes we want to talk about collections of sets, like we want to take a bunch of sets together and we want to talk about that. Now, if the collection is a set itself, then we can talk about it because it's an object in the universe of our sets. But what if it's not? So I'm going to make an informal definition. A class is simply a collection of sets. Now, this is an informal definition. With this definition, a class need not be a set. With this definition, a class is not necessarily a set, and hence not an object in the universe of sets. So a class may not be an object in the universe of sets. So how can we talk about classes? Like, we want to talk about them, and in English I can, I, 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 I've been just talking about it. But we want to talk about these classes in our axiomatic system. So what are we going to do? Yes, two days ago we learned that whenever we need to talk about objects in our axiomatic system, those objects have to be objects in our universe, which are all sets. So how can we talk about classes at all? So how can we refer to classes in our axiomatic system? There's a way to get around this problem. First of all, there are set theories like von neumann bernays gödel set theory where there are sets and classes as objects in the universe. So you can directly talk about classes. But in our setting, classes are not necessarily objects of the universe. So we cannot directly say that I picked some x and this x is the class, this class or that class. I can't really refer to it with a variable. My variables are supposed to only refer to sets. So how can we talk about classes? To get around this problem, people invented the following solution. For us, okay, let phi of x be a formula with one free variable. Okay, so I have a formula written in the language of set theory, it has one free variable. That is a property of sets. When, such, when I, from now on, when I say a property of sets, I mean, I simply mean a formula, okay? This is a property of sets. When you plug in some set, that property either holds or it does not hold, depending on whether this is true or false. Now, the class defined by phi of x is the collection. Now I'm going to use the usual first builder, uh, set builder notation you know. When I talk about the class defined by a property, by a formula, I simply mean the collection of all sets satisfying that formula. This is the collection of all sets such that this property holds. Okay? Sometimes we also we will also allow okay, maybe I should write this. Now from now on for the rest of the class, when I talk about classes, I'm gonna talk I only talk about classes defined by some formula, okay? So 
this was an informal definition, think of this as a more formal definition. For us, classes are simply collections defined by some formulas. But we also want to allow some parameters while defining classes. So I'm going to expand this definition in a second. So for us, classes for the rest of the course we shall only restrict our attention to those classes defined by some formulas. Defined by formulas. So that was an informal definition. This is a more formal definition for you. A class is a collection of this form. But this is a bit restrictive having only one free variable here. Here is the more general version. We, we will also allow classes to be defined by parameters. What do I mean by that? Let me write it over here. Let's Phi of x, y, z, dot, 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 let's go up to some letter. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just going to make it up. W. There. I don't care how many variables are there. So let this be a formula. It has many free variables. OK? I don't care how many. It can be arbitrarily many in the language of set theory. And let's. P, Q, R, dot, 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 I don't know, let's go up to U, B, fixed sets. Then the class defined by this formula and parameters Y, Z, dot, dot, W is the collection. Phi of x, p, q, r, dot, dot, u. So what I do is the following. I take a formula. It has many free variables. It is some property. It can say x belongs to y, and z not equals x, and blah, blah, whatever. I choose some sets. These are going to be my parameters. These are fixed. I fix these sets, and I look at, when I fix these sets, this formula in some sense becomes a formula with one free variable. The only variable is here x. I fixed these guys. Now, the collection of all sets x for which this is true is, again, a class. It's just like this, except I allow parameters. While defining this class, I not only use this formula, but I also use some sets. These are my parameters, OK? So for us, the most general definition of class would be this. A class is a collection which is defined by some formula and possibly by some, uh, with some parameters, OK? Now, every set is a class. This looks obvious. Well, this, OK, it doesn't look obvious. It sounds obvious, like it should be true. This is supposed to be a broader notion. It's a collection of sets. Well, a set is a collection of sets, so a set should be a class. But according to that, this definition, is it really? It is because we can define a set x by, well, you give me a set x. Now, x is fixed. You give me the set x. I want to define it like this. I can do the following seemingly stupid, but in reality, not stupid thing. I'm just going to write this formula down. X is fixed. X is a parameter. This is a formula written in the language of set theory. And by, according to this definition, this is a class. 
This is the class defined by this formula with this parameter. Well, the collection of all sets which belongs to X is simply X. So every set can be defined but from itself. Like every set can be defined by itself if you use that set as a parameter. So every set is a class. However, not every class is a set. And this is going to be the first theorem in this course. We're going to prove Russell's paradox. Well, we're not going to really prove Russell's paradox because it's a paradox, but I'm going to, just going to write the theorem and name it Russell's paradox because this is what it is. So every set is a class. However, not every class is a set. What do you mean? Sure. Okay. What is this? This is the collection of all sets, all sets which belong to X. Does the set X have any other element inside? No. A set always contains other sets. If I put all the sets which the set X contains together, then that's going to give me X. Now, let's see that the converse is not true. The class Russell's paradox, the class, let's name this R for Russell, x such that x does not belong to x, is not a set. This is a class, why? Well, maybe I should write this like this, negation. I'm going to talk about abbreviations in a second. The class of all sets which do not belong to themselves, <coughs> well, that's a class because this is a formula written in the language of set theory. This is a class. I claim that this is not a set. Another way of stating this is the following. It is not the case that there exists a set such that this set contains every set which do not belong to itself. Now, when I pass from here to here, I did something that some of you probably didn't understand. So let me talk about that before we prove this. So we developed a way of talking about classes. A class is simply defined by some formula and parameters. So what? Like, how does this allow us to talk about classes? I mean, I just gave you some definition of classes, which is more formal than that original definition. But how does this allow us to talk about classes? Let's say that I have a class C. Let's say that this is defined by some formula. Let's say that I have a class D and this is defined by some other formula. How can I state that these two classes are, for example, the same? How can I say this in my axiomatic system? Well, I can't refer to these in my axiomatic system because these are classes, not necessarily sets. But these are defined by these formulas which I can write down in my axiomatic system. So saying something like this is, this is the same as saying the following. For all x, this property holds if and only if this property holds. Okay? So these two things are equal, equivalent. Okay? Well, I'm just defining actually this to be, I want to talk about this in my axiomatic system. I'm saying that whenever I prove this in my axiomatic system, that's going to intuitively say that this class equals that class. Why? If for all sets, this property holds, if and only if this property holds, that means that any set in this class also belongs to this class, and any set in this class also belongs to this class. So if you have two classes, writing this down is the same as saying that these two classes are the same. And this is it, why I wrote this over here. The, the set Y is also a class defined by the formula x belongs to y. Russell's class is defined by this. So writing this is the same, this is the same as saying the set y equals 
the Russell class R, OK? Now we're going to prove that this is false. The proof is easy. We're going to do it by contradiction. Assume that. Assume to the contrary that this is not true. Assume to the contrary that there exists some y such that for all x, x belongs to y if and only if x does not belong to itself. OK, I keep writing this. I was going to talk about, I'm going to talk about this in a second, but you see, when, when we originally set up our axiomatic system, this was the correct way of writing things. But no one does this in practice. You just simply write this. So this is an abbreviation of this, OK? I, I don't want to put negations all the time. I'm just going to write not belongs to, OK? So we want to prove this. Assume to the contrary that there exists such a y. So let y be a set such that if there exists some y such that blah, blah happens, let's pick some y. Now for that y, this property should hold. But you see, this is true for all x. So in particular, I can let x to be y. If you let x to be y, then we have y belongs to y if and only if y does not belong to y, a contradiction. Thus, there does not exist a y which equals this Russell's class. So we just saw that not every class is a set. Classes like this are called proper classes, OK? A class is called a proper class if it's not a set. Classes that are not sets are called proper classes. One example is Russell's class. What's another example? We shall see later that the universe of sets is a proper class. The whole universe we shall see later that the whole universe is a proper class. How can I define the whole universe? How can I define the class of all sets? Well, I simply do this very simple thing. The set of all things that equal, <coughs> that equal themselves. This is the universe of sets. This is the whole universe V. So we shall see that this is also a proper class. We shall see that the class of car, the class of ordinals is a proper, a, a proper class. The class of cardinals is a proper class. But that's going to come later. Yes? Up to this point, we are talking intuitively, right? When we say x is equal to x. What do you mean intuitively? He, he didn't introduce our x in so. Yeah, in, in a sense, yes, yes. Well, I mean, when I say, like, when I do, use the set builder notation, you see, I'm somehow working uh, outside my axiomatic system. In my axiomatic system, I can't write things like this. This is not allowed. But when you translate everything properly to your axiomatic system, you can just prove these things. Like we will prove that there is no set which contains all sets. That's the same as saying this is a proper class. We're going to prove that later. OK. Enough about classes. I'm going to start introducing the axioms if you're ready. Are you ready? Say yes. OK, so we can start. So we said earlier that, OK, we talked about the axiomatic method. And we said that, like, we talked about our axiomatic system. We gave a meaning to the things we write in our axiomatic system. And we said that. We have to assume something to deduce something. From nothing, you cannot deduce anything, OK? So you have to start with something. And we're going we're gonna to assume these axioms. These axioms are supposed to be sentences which are intuitively true, OK? I cannot just start with, I mean, I can say that for all x, there exists y, there exists as such that blah, blah happens. I can just come up with a weird axiom. But then people would question that axiom, like, why is this true? 
So whatever axes I'm going to choose, those should be somehow intuitively obvi obvious. So what's the, most intu what's the most obvious thing about the universe of sets? Like, we have an intuitive understanding of sets. What's the most obvious thing? There are sets. That's the most obvious thing. The, so the universe is not empty. There are sets. So I should introduce an axiom which says that there are sets. Well, what's the most simple set? A set is supposed to contain other sets. But maybe there's a set which does not contain anything, which you ca called empty set, I guess, in primary school. So that empty set exists seems like a good choice for an axiom, which says that the universe is not empty. And that's our first axiom, axiom of empty set. There exists a set with no elements. Now, each time I introduce an axiom, at least for six or seven axioms, I'm going to write the axiom in English, then I'm going to write its proper version in our axiomatic system. So there exists some x such that for all y, y does not belong to x. There exists a set to which no sets belong, OK? Now, if we assume that, we now know that there are sets in, there are sets in the universe of sets. So the universe of sets is not void. By the way, when I talked about axioms, OK, I should have mentioned this earlier. I always assume the logical axioms. Like we, I said we are working in first order logic. That implicitly forces me to assume all the logical axioms. All tautologies are axioms. You learned about tautologies, right? All tautologies I assume is an axiom. So I also have, I have this logical axioms. This is my first non-logical axiom. Now I know that the empty set exists. Here's a question. How many empty sets are there? Can you, like, how many, how many empty sets are there? Can there be more than one empty set? Can, can there be two sets? which are both empty, but they are different. Take a guess. Intuitively, there should not be two empty sets. Because if a set is empty and this is empty, th this should be the same. Why? Because we think that sets are characterized exactly by their elements. But if you only assume this axiom, you cannot prove that there's only one empty set. And that's actually a theorem, not a guess. If you assume only this axiom, you cannot prove that the empty set is unique. Now, intuitively speaking, sets are characterized by their elements. This suggests the following axiom. This suggests the introduction of the following axiom. Axiom 2, this is called the axiom of extensionality. Axiom of extensionality says the following. Two sets are equal if and only if they have they have the same elements so the only feature of sets is to contain other sets and if two like if there are two objects which does this in the same way they should be the same object if they if there are two objects which contain exactly the same sets, then they should be the same. For all x, for all y, for all z, if x and y contain exactly the same sets, then they're the same. Now, sometimes people put this as well. 
it's really your choice. This is actually a logical axiom. This is called Leibniz principle of indiscernibles. This, is, this part actually follows from the rules of first order logic. This part does not. This is why we introduce it as an axiom. So let's put both sides of the arrow. So this is our second axiom. Now we have two axioms. We can actually prove something. So let's prove our second theorem in set theory, which says that empty set is unique. We next show using axiom one and two that there is only one empty set. Theorem. If x and y are empty sets, meaning that they contain no elements, so that means that, OK, a set is empty if it has no members. You know what it is. Well, x is empty if and only if. It's not the case that for all y, y is not x. That's better. If we have two empty sets, then they're the same. Why? Again, we can prove this in two lines. Let's prove the contrapositive. Let x and y be sets. Let's pick two sets. Now assume that, we want to prove the contrapositive. Assume that they're not the same. Assume that I have two sets which are not the same, empty or not, I don't really care. Then, by axiom of extensionality, there exists some z such that z belongs to x and z doesn't belong to y, or z doesn't belong to x and z belongs to y. If they're not the same, then this if and only if statement fails. This if and only statement can fail in two ways. Either this is true and this is true or these two are true. In both cases, One of x and y is non empty. If we are in this case, then x is non empty. If we are in this case, then y is non empty. So whenever this is false, this is false as well. They are not empty at the same time. OK. That's good. We, act, we were actually we were able to prove something with the two axioms. Unfortunately, with these two axioms, you can't do more than this. You can only prove that the empty set is unique and you can prove basic stuff. But we want ZFC axioms to be a foundation of mathematics. We want to be able to pull off all these mathematical tricks using these axioms. So we have to, be, we have to introduce more axioms that allow us to do more. OK, so let's introduce a couple more axioms. Before that, let's name this set. From now on, we shall denote the empty set by, now, you already know this notation. Why am I writing this? You see, in my axiomatic system, there is no such symbol. In my axiomatic system, I can't write this. In my axiomatic system, whenever I need to write x is empty, I need to write this. Now, you see this has one, two, five symbols. This is too much. Every time I need to write empty set, I don't want to write this. So I'm, I introduce a shorthand. When I write this down, it means the set x such that this is true. So strictly speaking, we're not allowed to use this kind of stuff in our axiomatic system. Informally, we should do it because I don't have enough space to write everything down. 
as I said, we're not really working in, our, in that axiomatic system. Okay? At least in practice. So th this is the notation for empty set, which is historically introduced by Bourbaki, if you know who that is. Well, it's not a single person, but this is introduced by Bourbaki. So we named the empty set. We proved that the empty set is unique, but we have to build more sets. Okay, this is my universe of sets. I have the empty set. What other set should exist? I give you the empty set. It exists. It's unique. What else should exist? The set containing the empty set should exist, right? But how can you prove that this exists? There is no axiom telling you that. So I should have an axiom that allows me to build more sets. Take a set and put it in another set. And that's going to be our third axiom. Axiom of pairing. Let x and y be sets. Then, well, if x and y are sets, then there exists a set Z whose only members are X and Y. Let's write this more formally within our axiomatic system. For all sets, for all sets X and for all sets Y, there exists some Z such that Okay, I'm going to explain this notation in a second. Well, never mind. If t belongs to z, then t is x or t is y. Yes. Given any two sets, there exists a third set such that all the only members of that third set are x and y. Okay? This allows you to pair sets into one set. So this, this simply says if x and y are sets, then this class is a set. OK? Yes? Yes, you're right. I don't want that. It's correct in the notes, right? OK. While writing notes, I don't usually make mistakes. In class, I do a lot. So fix the typos. Just double check it with the notes. How about that class? Is it like t equals x or t equals y? Yes. Or well, it can't be end, right? One thing cannot be equal to two different things at the same time. If x and y are different, this will be automatically false. It's or. Any member should be either x or y. Now, using, this act, using these three axioms, now I can build more sets. And I will actually construct what you call order pairs. I have the empty set. Choose x to be the empty set, y to be the empty set. Then this set exists by these three axioms. Now, I can pair these two numbers, these two sets. Choose that to be x, choose that to be y. I can form this set. You see, that allows me to build more sets. The unfortunate consequence of these three axioms is that they only allow you to build sets with two elements. You cannot build, with these th three axioms, you cannot build sets with more than two elements because axiom of pairing doesn't allow that. So we're going to introduce more and more axioms. Just wait a little bit. So, but before that we have to take care of the ordered pairs. So I know that you learned about Cartesian products. This is what? This is, don't write this. This is the set of all pairs such that blah, blah. What the hell is this? What is an ordered pair? It's not a set, it's an ordered pair. If it were a set, I would call it a set. It's an ordered pair. What is an ordered pair? I want everything to be sets. So ordered pairs should be sets. How do I do that? How do I define ordered pairs in terms of sets? Krotowski came up with a very nice definition for this. Let x and 
yb sets. Using axiom 3, we can build the set. Now, I can pair x with itself and form the set containing x. I can pair x and y and form the set. Now, I have two sets. I can pair these two sets using this axiom and build this set. This set is, from now on, this set is called the ordered pair of x and y and is denoted by the usual ordered pair notation. This set, whose existence is guaranteed by the axiom of pairing, this is called the unordered pair. So, unordered pair, ordered pair, I'm just introducing some terminology. Now, basic lemma, proof is an exercise, so let me write that down. You must have done this in 111. If not, do it here. Why is, it, why is this called an ordered pair and that unordered pair? Over here, the order doesn't matter because a set is not measured by in which order it contains things. It's measured by what it contains. However, over here, the order is important, as shown by this lemma. If two ordered pairs are the same, then their first components are the same and their second components are the same. Now, in, in past, you probably learned this as a property of ordered pairs, some kind of assumption. Like, I define ordered pairs so that this holds. If you define ordered pairs like this, you can prove this. You can prove this. Actually, why am I writing if then? If and only if. This is very basic. You can just do this on your, on your own time, OK? This is like 111. Now, we introduce ordered pairs. That's good. I have three axioms. I am able to build certain sets. But unfortunately, no sets with more than two elements. I mean, they probably exist. Actually, they exist, but these axioms do not allow me to prove that. OK, so we did that, we did that. Now, as I said, the reason we are introducing these axioms is we want to do mathematics within this axiomatic system, and it should give us enough tools to do mathematics to do all those tricks. And second, these axioms should be intuitively obvious. All the axioms I introduced up to now, they should be intuitively true at least. Anyway, what, what was I going to say? Yeah. So let's talk about operations on sets, which you learned in secondary school. If you have two sets, what operations do you have? You have their intersection, you have their union. Here's the question. You know what this means intuitively. You take the elements of x and y together, you put them in a single set. Can you prove with these three axioms that whenever you have two sets, there's a third set, which is this guy? The answer is no, you cannot. You have to have additional axioms to prove that unions exist. And that's going to be the next axiom. Axiom 4, axiom of union. Now, this is going to, the statement will look a bit different than the union you know. So pay attention to this one. For any set x, there exists a set y which contains the members of members of x which contains exactly did i introduce the axiom like that yes now let's understand let me write down the formal statement 
for all the x, there exists y such that for all z, z belongs to y if and only if there exists s, s in x, and z in s. We can ignore the formal statement for now. Let's understand this axiom. What this axiom says is the following. If you have a set, this set possibly has other sets as its element, unless it's empty. It may be empty. There are other sets inside this. This axiom says, that for, if you give me any set, there exists a set Y which contains exactly the members of members of X. So there's a set Y which contains exactly members of members of X. So for any set X, there is a set Y, which is, in a sense, the union of these little guys. OK? The set Y in this axiom is called the union of X and is denoted by this notation. Now, this is why I said pay attention. You probably didn't see this notation before. You, you took the union of many sets. There's a notion of union of a single set. Union of a single set means that you, you really take the union of its elements. OK? So this set Y over here is called the union of X. So whenever you're given a collection of sets like this, when you talk about the union of that collection, you really mean you take the elements of these guys together and put them in a single set. OK? Is this understood? Now, the axiom of union tells me that the union of a set X exists. OK? So the union of a set X is the set of all Y which belong to some member of which belong to some member of X. OK. Questions about this? Now, let's, let me write some basic examples. Very basic ones. <coughs> the union of empty set is empty because in order, well, empty set, OK, let's just think this formally. If x is the empty set, this statement is always false. Therefore, this statement is always false. Therefore, this statement should be always false. Well, if this is always false, then y is the empty set. So the union of empty set is that. Now, the union of this set, let's calculate this. I need to put the members of members of this set into a single set. This set only has one member, which is that. And I put the members of that in a single set. So this is that. OK? I can write down more examples, but I don't want to. I want to talk about something else. Now, let's look at this class. This is a class. Why is this a class? Because this is a formula written in the language of set theory. It has, there are no z's here. This is y. This is y. It has the parameter x inside, OK? This is a nice formula with parameter x. This is a class. The axiom of union tells me that this class is indeed a set. Now, there's a dual notion of union. It's called the intersection. The dual notion of the union of a set is the intersection of a set. Shown by which is the following. Now, the union of a set is the really the union of its members. So the intersection of a set should be the intersection of its members. So the intersection of a single set is the set of all y, which belong to every member of x. Now, 
The intersection should be the following class. Y is in the intersection if it belongs to every member of X. If it be, if it, why is it over here? If only if it belongs to every member of X. So basically, the intersection is the following. You take all these sets, you intersect them together at the same time. That defines intersection. Here's the question. Is this a set? Now, over here, I just wrote down a class. Like, when I do this, when I use the set builder notation, I just write, uh, over here, I write down a formula. This defines a class. I name it like this. So what? This is a class. Is this a set? Can you deduce from these four axioms that th this class is really a set? The answer turns out to be no. We're going to need an additional axiom for that, which is going to be called axiom of separation. But that's going to come in 10 minutes. OK, let's have a 10 minute break and be back here at 41. OK, 1241.